Welcome to chapter three of physiological psychology from the textbooks, textbook brain and behavior. Let's get started. Chapter three, the organization and functions of the nervous system. Something to pick up your mood, go ahead and list 10 things for which you're grateful. Another reminder in terms of success, of course, memory um, builds on itself. And if you can study over uh, a period of time very regularly, study, sleep on it, study, sleep on it, study, and sleep on it, um, the ability to retain that information is going to significantly increase versus just doing uh, a major cram session. The way that you can enable yourself to uh, take advantage of this type of uh, memorizing is to manage your time and also helps you to sort of uh, relax and sort of decrease your anxiety by knowing what you have to do and when to do it and being conscious and intentional about it. Um, one way to do that is to block off time in your planner, in your weekend view planner. More important things like studying and uh, when you have to attend school uh, classes and as well as working out and different stuff like that. In your month in view, uh, you want to put in due dates for uh, finals, midterms, quizzes, et cetera, papers, uh, important due dates uh, for your classes. I like to highlight them in different colors and that can kind of provide a great visual. Um, the reason why you want to write out uh, in the monthly planner, and I really like a paper one, is uh, your due dates. Uh, why you want to write it out is because it enables you to see things in advance. It enables you to see things um, in the coming weeks ahead so that you can plan better um, in terms of blocking out necessary time for important things. Yes, it's about blocking off time, but it's also about making sure that you do those blocked off times. So you want to set daily and weekly goals, take a look at your planner regularly, and then uh, when you complete those blocks, mark it off. Feels really great to mark it off. Um, that's one of the things I love about a physical planner. And um, another key component of self-management is to overcome procrastination. Uh, one uh, skill, if you will, is to force yourself to do work even if you don't feel like it, as Will Smith says. And once in a while, you have to use your metacognitive uh, process of taking a look at what you're doing and seeing if you're getting the outcomes that you want. If not, uh, non-judgmentally, uh, ask yourself, what can I do differently? Excuse me, to achieve those outcomes, you can ask yourself while you're in school, what you're willing to do to achieve success in school, and most importantly, what you're willing to give up and sacrifice. Go ahead, snail, climb Mount Fuji, but slowly, slowly, as the great Kobayashi Isa once said, Lao Tzu, attributed to Lao Tzu, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. You want to set goals that have a start and possible, pretty much an idea of a completion date and then write out specific actions with measurable outcomes, which include duration and frequency. Don't just say, I'll study more, I wanna study more. You can say, I'll study for five hours a day for uh, five days a week or something like that. And that way you have the frequency, uh, how often and duration for how long. So what is the nervous system? It's a network of billions of cells in the brain and the body responsible for all aspects of what we think, feel, and do, about 86 billion. You can see here the Sistine Chapel looking very similar to the cross section of the brain. Of course, I like to uh, test myself and sort of mimic ways that you might test yourself or show you ways that you might test yourself. So take a look at the nervous system, the CNS and the PNS. CNS with the brain and spinal cord and the PNS made up of the somatic nervous system and the autonomic nervous system, which can also be broken down into the sympathetic nervous system and parasympathetic nervous system, the fight or flight and relax mode. Oh, I thought I had another slide there for covering up. I think I will later on that though. 
Okay, uh, nervous system has three basic functions to receive sensory input from the world through vision, hearing, touch, taste, and smell. Process the information in the brain by paying attention to it, perceiving it, and remembering it, and respond to the information by acting upon it. CNS, part of the nervous system that consists of the brain and the spinal cord, made up of 100 billion nerve cells. I think I said 86 billion previously, which is the brain, but the spine, including the spinal cord, it's up to 100 billion. And then the PNS, peripheral nervous system, part of the nervous system that enables nerves to connect the central nervous system to the muscles, organs, and glands. And there's that slide again. And it still doesn't have the cover. I think it's coming up in another slide. I'm jumping ahead of myself. The CNS completely surrounded by bones, suspended in cerebral uh, spinal fluid, covered by meninges, skin layers, and protected by the blood brain barrier. Purple nervous system, uh, again, made up of the somatic nervous system and autonomic nervous system. That looks like an Alex Gray painting there. Somatic nervous system, as the name sounds, with soma regulates body activities that are under conscious control, such as the movement of skeletal muscles. And the autonomic nervous system controls smooth muscle glands, heart, and other organs. And there are two divisions, remember, the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. Sympathetic, fight or flight gets your body ready for fight or flight, and parasympathetic calms your body down. And there is a diagram of what happens with the sympathetic nervous system and parasympathetic nervous system. That's why poker players um, will wear, uh, one of the reasons why they wear uh, sunglasses where you can't see their eyes, well, if you see their eyes dilate, that might indicate the sympathetic nervous system activation Pupils dilate, dilate your lungs, uh, the respiration increases, uh, heart rate increases, and your digestion decreases, all to prepare you for fight or flight. Of course, you don't need to digest food. You need to get your heart rate up, get your uh, respiration up uh, to get all that oxygen to your body, get ready for that fight or flight, and your pupils dilated to be able to take in all that light. Parasympathetic, on the other hand, returns the body to a resting state. And so you can see the opposite is what's going on here. Will it be covered now? <laughs> oh, there it is. So you can go ahead and see if you can pause right now. Give yourself one thing. Okay, one more time to look at it and then pause and see if you can get those right. And let's take a look at the central nervous system, the CNS, the brain, three main brain divisions, the forebrain, midbrain, and hindbrain. And you can also see the spinal cord there. It's like he's now testing regularly. And let's take a look at the cortical and subcortical structures of the uh, forebrain. So you can see here the cerebral cortex, all these folds, the basal ganglia, thalamus, hippocampus, amygdala, and hypothalamus, and their related functions. We'll be kind of breezing through this. You can, of course, pause, uh, and we'll be going um, over this in more depth in the later part of the lecture. My purpose of showing you these sort of over and over, if you will, is to get you familiar with them. And give yourself a pause, or go ahead and pause the video now and fill in the blanks. Let's see if you can get them right. Use your hippocampus to input that, those memories. Four lobes of the cerebral cortex can be broken into the frontal lobe, parietal lobe, occipital lobe, and temporal lobe. Frontal lobe responsible for complex thought, planning, movement, parietal lobe, touch, spatial relations, occipital lobe, vision, and temporal lobe, hearing, and memory. Let's see if you can get those. 
midbrain. You can see uh, the midbrain is made up of one of the uh, structures, some substantia nigra. And then you can also see the hindbrain, which is made up of the cerebellum, pons, and medulla, and their associated functions. So we'll go a little, a little more in depth to this up here. And pause, see if you can get those. And being able to name them and name what their functions are is, is very helpful. Um, to be able to locate them on the brain is very helpful and fun and cool. Go ahead and take a look at these uh, definitions, looking at the functions of the various structures in the hind brain, midbrain forebrain subcortical structures and the forebrain cortical structures. Study them. And then on the next slide, you are going to sort of fill in the blanks as to what they are. Hindbrain, midbrain, forebrain, subcortical, cortical. Let's see if we got that right. And now let's see if you can fill in the blanks here. Of course, the strongest way to study them is to be able to know it without the fill in the blanks, which maybe a later slide, or you can just cover that up and then see if you can fill it in. But fill in the blank is equally uh, challenging when you're first learning the information. So go ahead and pause the video and give that a shot. Some of the coolest brain dissection videos. Um, this the second one is uh, this gal slicing into a brain with a big red slicer, and the top one uh, brain dissection uh, video that's really helpful and uh, I think worth a lot of these worth watching and taking a look at. So go ahead and pause the video, click those uh, videos, take a look at those and return here. And hopefully those uh, videos were very helpful and then the 3D uh, brain animations and such. So you really have got a good feel for uh, the various parts of the brain. And I think it brings things to life more and even thinking about the different things of what I'm doing right now in terms of processing in different areas of the brain that are activating. Um, certainly cool to think about uh, those things and uh, how that is creating my consciousness at this moment. From your text, let's get the term straight, terms for axons and cell bodies in the nervous system. If you look at a bundle of axons in the peripheral nervous system, they're called nerves, but in the central nervous system, they're called tracks group of cell bodies in the peripheral is ganglion and the CNS, they're called nucleus. Let's take a look and see how the CNS develops. Uh, the neural tube, the brain develops from a hollow tubular structure. The upper tube develops into the forebrain, midbrain, and hindbrain, as you can see right here. It's development and eventual into at birth. And the lower tube becomes the spinal cord. So let's take a look at the cerebrum, um, the left and right cerebral hemispheres are separated by a longitudinal fissure. The outer surface is called the cerebral cortex. So we're going to look at uh, a lot of those things that we previously looked at um, and sort of were testing ourselves. We're going to look at more in depth now. So the outer surface is called the cerebral cortex, lined with a bark made up of mostly cell bodies of neurons that are not myelinated, and those are gray matter. Uh, in the uh, video, she called them beige matter. They should be called beige matter. So as you can see here in this brain, they're tracing over the gray matter. Then you can see the white matter, which are myelinated axons, and the white matter. Uh, its color is uh, because of the myelination, the fatty tissue covering the axons. And together they make up the cerebrum, cerebral cortex, if you will, that outer, 
section plus all of it together. Sorry about that. The gyrus, of course, in the video, as she pointed out with her uh, poker thing, are the ridges, as you can see. In the sulcus are the small grooves, and the fissures are the uh, larger grooves. And the grooves are the spaces between the two gyri. The brain sort of grew from inside out, as you can see. And then as it got uh, towards the humans, they had a lot, had to make a lot of room for this cerebral cortex. And as you can see, it just kind of folds on each other in various places. Axons come together in the middle of each gyrus, giving these sections a whitish appearance. In forebrain, major structures of the two hemispheres of the cerebrum and subcortical regions such as the thalamus, hypothalamus, hippocampus, amygdala, and basal ganglia. And as you can see here, hypothalamus, the eat, drink, and be merry um, part of the brain, as I like to call it, regulates body functions such as eating, uh, drinking, sex, uh, motivates behavior, aggression. Amygdala associates emotions with experiences, especially fear. Hippocampus involved in the formation and indexing of memories from short-term memory to long-term memory. The thalamus thought of as the sensory gateway for searing, seeing, seeing and hearing, or searing. Uh, and the basal ganglia, motor planning, movement, and reward, of which dopamine is a big factor in that, the feel-good neurotransmitter. In the four lobes and what they're involved in. And as you can see here, just in this slide, the difference in the cortex region between a human and a bird or a fish or a frog. We have much more of our brain region devoted to cortex. and increased uh, uncommitted or association areas of the cortex, especially as compared to the rat or cat, as well as the chimpanzee. And remember that these vast areas of the brain are responsible for integrating and acting on information received and processed by the sensory areas. So this slide right here again shows you the four lobes of the cerebral cortex, but then it breaks down important regions within the lobe. So let's take a look at that. Um, as you can see right here, the primary motor cortex related to motor actions, and then you have the primary associational cortex over here, and that'll be in a future slide too, but I'm just referencing it. Uh, the primary somatosensory cortex related to touch and uh, touch within visuospatial um, areas. And as you can see, sort of integrating that visual information as it comes in here. And uh, their uh, primary uh, or secondary or associational areas of somatosensory, primary visual cortex and their associational, associational areas. Um, in the occipital lobe, the associational areas end up being the occipital plus the temporal lobe, the support base area, and then the primary auditory cortex related to hearing. Again, we'll go into more other structures that are in the uh, temporal uh, lobe. Future slide here. So again, I was pointing out those primary sensory cortex, the motor, as you can see here, are color coded as well. Uh, the motor cortex, the frontal cortex, and then you've got the somatosensory related to touch, visual, primary visual cortex, and primary auditory cortex. And when uh, a person views simple contours, boundaries, gives you a sense of location, for example, um, or sensory qualities like color, pitch, some of these sort of basic sensory qualities, um, these areas will be activated. So simple contours of feeling them or seeing them or boundaries or location. But as you can see here with the associational cortex, 
um, each primary cortex also has an associational cortex. So you can see the auditory cortex expands here and connects to an associational cortex. The occipital um, primary cortex, visual primary cortex, excuse me, um, relates to the also the associational cortex as well in these purple areas. Um, and uh, each primary cortex has an associational cortex. What does it do? It combines information to represent complex objects or patterns, integrates information from different modes. For example, you can juggle a ball without looking at it, identify an object in your hand while blindfolded, or identify an angry face as in the fusiform face area, as well as its connection to the amygdala. So as you can see that uh, the brain works in conjunction with one another, sure there are certain areas that are localized, but it also is interconnected. And through that interconnection, it works to produce that experience that you have. Again, the associational cortex, uh, visual associational cortex, as you can see right here, responds when the eye looks at complex patterns for example, images of objects, abstract forms, faces, and the fusiform face area. The auditory associational cortex, recognition of what sounds mean. And it responds to, for example, bird calls versus, uh, or speech sounds versus just pure tones, whereas that's where the uh, primary auditory cortex would respond. The somatosensory associational cortex responds to objects by touch, where you can uh, be able to notice what they are just by closing your eyes and, and uh, feeling what it is. Motor associational cortex, control of the execution of movement. And then the higher order associational cortex, which carries out complex processes not associated with any sense. For example, language, uh, executive functions, thinking, planning. Roca's and Bernanke's area, of course, linked to speech production and comprehension. Uh, Roca's area is in this area right here, and Bernanke's area is back here. Roca's area related to speech production and Bernanke's to uh, language comprehension. Cerebral cortex is arranged in six layers. Layers two and three are the associational. One is the layers of the top layer of the meninges, um, via matter, stuff like that, dura matter. Uh, layer four, sensory, layer five and six, motor organized in groups of 80 to 100 interconnected neurons that are arranged in vertical columns. Each cells within interconnected neurons have similar functions. For example, cells may receive sensory input from adjacent areas on the skin. Highlighted on those videos pretty nicely, but just uh, to understand when people are talking about different areas of the brain in reference to different other areas, and there'll be labels as well as, as certain parts of the brain. So you can see right here the anterior versus posterior, front versus back, superior, above, inferior, below, dorsal on top, ventral down below, Again, in terms of the back of the body versus the belly of the body, in terms of top, down, below, so not the same as inferior and superior. Medial is in the middle, lateral is out to the sides. And as you can see right here, and that's of course in a coronal uh, section of the brain right there, and you can see that right here, the coronal section sliced right here in the middle, uh, sagittal like this and horizontal like this. Coronal, sagittal, and horizontal. Uh, but goes over just a couple uh, sort of uh, important little grooves or fissures or sulcus, if you will. The central sulcus uh, separates the frontal lobe, as you can see right here, from the parietal lobe. So that's the central sulcus. It's all the way down to the temporal lobe. Lateral fissure separates the frontal lobe from the temporal lobe. So you can see here the lateral fissure. 
in the central gyrus, uh, part of the somatosensory cortex. So it's like one of the additions there that you haven't seen yet. And precentral gyrus, in other words, for the uh, part of the motor cortex. The primary motor cortex, uh, or let's go over frontal lobe uh, movement and complex uh, human capabilities. The primary motor cortex is found on the precentral gyrus, which controls <clears throat> voluntary non-reflexive movement. It is somatotopic, which means that the parts of the body are mapped onto the motor area of each hemisphere in the form of a homunculus or a little man. Um, cells that control the muscles of the hand, for example, are adjacent to cells controlling the arm, etc on the cortex, parts of the body that make precise movements, such as hands, fingers, have more cortex devoted to their control. And it is pictorially represented in terms of how much cortex is devoted to it by how big you see the different um, organs and such, like the lips and the hand and so for parts of the body. Frontal lobe, uh, continuing here, the primary motor cortex controls voluntary non-reflexive movement. Premotor cortex integrates sensory information, controls muscles closest to the body's main access, and the supplementary motor cortex, as you can see right here, planning uh, complex movements, hand movements. So remember, there's the primary motor cortex, but then there's also the associational uh, motor cortex. Um, other structures involved in movement, the cerebellum, fine tunes movement, stores uh, learned sequences of movement, so it actually stores memories. Prefrontal cortex and posterior parietal cortex. Let's see right here. Thalamus, you not see that inside here, and the basal ganglia. A couple of TED Talks that I think are very interesting. One is on how to control someone else's arm and how a brain can communicate to another brain. Broca's area important for speech production, contributing to movements involved in speech and grammatical structure. Broca's aphasia is often described as having the words on the tip of your tongue. It's called non-fluent aphasia because speech is effortful, involves starts and stops. Another defining feature is that if sentences are produced, they often have incorrect syntax or word order and grammar. So difficulty producing um, the right words is what people with broken aphasia have. then goes over the prefrontal cortex. Um, it's very functionally complex. The largest region of the human brain, two times as large as in chimps, and accounts for 29% of the total cortex. As you can see, many of the functions are typically human, forming strategies, planning and organization, impulse control and delayed gratification, as we saw with Phineas Gage, who had damage to his prefrontal cortex. Adjusting behavior in response to rewards and punishments. Decision-making, considering the future and making predictions. Initiation and control over the execution of deliberate actions. Modulation of intense emotions. Targeting attention. Problem solving. Inhibiting inappropriate behavior. As again, Phineas Gage, initiating appropriate behavior processes in working memory as well, and social behavior and reasoning. And there's Phineas Gage and the difficulties he had. Parietal lobe, let's take a look at that. So we just looked at the frontal lobe, now let's take a look at the parietal lobe. Parietal lobe important for body sensations, attention, perception, and spatial localization. Primary somatosensory cortex on the post-central gyrus. 
processes skin touches, touch, warmth, cold, pain, and the senses that inform us about body position in space and movement. Sense receptors, touch, pain, temperature, body position, send info to the thalamus and to the primary somatosensory cortex. Again, it is somatotopically mapped, similar to the parts of the body. And you can see that here with the sensory, somatosensory cortex in the blue. Of course, what has more cortex space devoted to it will be bigger. As you can see here, thumb, lips, very sensitive. And tongue has more uh, cortex space relative to your leg or your knee. Sensory areas are known as projection areas. So this area is known as a somatosensory projection area. Parietal association areas combine information from body senses and vision. Be able to identify objects by touch, sense texture, determine the location of limbs in space, time, if you will, and locate objects in space as well. So very important that it's right by the visual cortex. As you can see, they're sort of interacting with one another. To be right next to one another in the brain makes sense. Posterior parietal cortex damage causes neglect, disorder in which one person ignores objects, people, and activity on the side opposite to the brain damage. Frequently damage in the right parietal lobe. So they ignore the left side, and there's different types of neglect, visual, motor, auditory, in this case, it's a visual type of neglect. You can see that they uh, neglect the left side. Okay, so we just reviewed the frontal lobe and the parietal lobe. Next, we're going to review the temporal lobe. And as you can see, some important areas in the temporal lobe contains the primary, um, of course, separated from the frontal and parietal lobes, uh, the lateral fissure right here. And let's take a look at it. it. Contains a primary auditory projection area. As you can see here, the primary auditory cortex, and then also the auditory associational areas. Um, and visual association, er association areas and Wernicke's area involved in language comprehension and production. Wernicke's area should be right there. The inferior, inferior temporal cortex is concerned with visual identification of objects, for example, uh, familiar objects. And the fusiform face area is located in the fusiform gyrus in this area and allows us to recognize familiar faces. People who have damage to this area have a condition known as prosopagnosia and have the, an impaired ability to recognize familiar faces, including their own. As you can see right here, here's the inferior uh, temporal cortex, with the superior temporal gyrus, middle temporal gyrus, and inferior temporal gyrus. While the pen field stimulate pupils temporal lobes with electrical current. Simulate the primary auditory projection areas, but these provoke only unorganized meanness sensations, such as tingling lights or buzzing sounds. The stimulation of the auditory association areas, the temporal cortex. 25% of the patients reported hearing music or familiar voices. So quite fascinating. And here's uh, actual brain. The, uh, stimulated there and different number of tags allowed people to relate to uh, areas to patients' responses. That people can actually hear music. So it's, it's that you could stimulate brain activity and hear familiar voices and 
music that you heard in the past. It's quite fascinating. The occipital lobe, of course, is the visual cortex. Uh, and it's located here, the posterior uh, part of the brain. Uh, primary visual projection area, posterior tip contains a map of visual space. Adjacent receptors in the eyes send information to adjacent points in the visual cortex. So it's uh, somewhat somatically, uh, somatotopically uh, arranged. Visual association area, anterior to primary projection area, four association areas that detect individual components of a scene, such as color, this area, these areas, color, movement, form. This information is then combined and processed further in other association areas, particularly in the temporal and the parietal lobes. Remember, we talked about that, integrating with the uh, parietal lobes, integrating information from the senses with information from uh, touch senses from within where your body is in relationship to um, you know, time space with visual information and with visual information interacting in the temporal lobe as well with the uh, various uh, visual associational cortex uh, cortices such as fusiform uh, face gyrus or piece of form face area. And there's a TED talk also uh, from B.S. Ramachandra. Uh, it's very interesting that you may enjoy. And again, now taking a look at the subcortical structures. See, so keep on seeing them. You're going to like know exactly what they are and what they relate to. So. I guess that's my purpose of showing them over and over. Let's take a look at them a little more in depth now. So you have the thalamus lies just below the lateral ventricles. See so right here, pretty big structure too, right? When we saw the cutting open of the brain, two thalami, of course, side by side, receives information from all the sensory systems except olfactory and relates it to the respective cortical projection area. So it takes it in, um, from the um, senses and then uh, sends it to the re respective cortical projection areas. The hypothalamus, uh, smaller structure, just inferior to the thalamus, major role in controlling emotion and motivated behaviors, such as eating, drinking, and sexual activity, controls the autonomic nervous system, controls the pituitary gland, the master gland, and so influences the body's hormonal environment. Such a small structure yet accounts for a huge uh, part of our lives. Thalamus. See it right there. Highlighted. Pineal gland, Descartes' seal, uh, seat of the soul, regulates daily rhythms, secretes melatonin, which induces sleep. As you saw in the video, the corpus callosum connects two hemispheres um, with these fibers. Uh, patients who have had this severed to control seizures behave in interesting ways that show the differences in hemispheric functioning as the hemispheres are not talking to one another. So you can present stuff in the left visual field and that information will go into the right and present stuff in the right visual field, and that information will go to the left. Information goes in the left, they can verbalize that information well. Um, but if the information goes to the right, they have trouble verbalizing the information, but they can identify it, they can point to it, for example. The anterior commissure is secondary smaller band of connecting fibers. Um, it's not really talked about as much as the corpus callosum. Ventricles interconnected with one another and filled with cerebrospinal fluid, which carries materials from the blood to the CNS and removes waste materials. Two lateral, lateral ventricles on each side of the cerebral cortex, a third below, and the fourth in the brainstem. And that second video where they're slicing through the brain was very helpful in looking at the ventricles. Let's take a look now at the midbrain. So we're going lower and lower in the brain. Midbrain contains structures that have secondary roles in vision, audition, and movement. 
Superior colliculi guide eye movement and fixation of gaze. The inferior colliculi help direct, locate direction of sounds. Substantia nigra projects to basal ganglia to integrate movements. It's dopamine releasing cells degenerate in Parkinson's disease. And the VTA, the ventral tegmental area, plays a role in rewarding effects of food, sex, and drugs. Person can say the next time that person stimulated my VTA. Oh, here we go. Don't get too excited there. Hindbrain, reticular formation, collection of nuclei running through the midbrain and hindbrain contains pawns related to sleep and arousal. Attention and aspects of motor activity such as the reflexes and muscle tone. Also contained in the hindbrain are the pawns and the medulla or medulla oblongata, interchangeable words there. Pawns related to sleep and arousal connects the two hemispheres of the cerebellum also as pathways connecting to higher areas of the brain, brain stem. And medulla oblongata, responsible for regulating several basic functions of the autonomic nervous system, including respiration, cardiac function, vasodilation, reflexes like vomiting, coughing, sneezing, and swallowing. Uh, great, I was just eating lunch right now. We had to mention the viewer. Hey, take a look at this video down below. Highly informative. Actually, kind of funny. Take a break. Enjoy your life. Some fresh H2O. No, Colonel Sanders, you're wrong. The hindbrain, uh, made up of the cerebellum. And the cerebellum refines movements initiated by the motor cortex by controlling their speed, intensity, and direction. A person with a damaged cerebellum has trouble making precise reaching movements and walks with difficulty because the automatic patterning of movement has been lost. Person also has uncoordinated gait, seems drunk. Plays a role in motor learning, cerebellum does, and research implicated it in other cognitive functionings, believe it or not, such as attention, language, and emotional control. So as you can see now, the whole localization thing and the interconnectedness of the brain are highlighted here. The spinal cord is a finger, finger sized cable of neurons that carry sensory information to the brain and uh, afferent and motor commands to the muscles and organs, otherwise known as effort. I just think of that as effort. You have to make effort, you know, make an effort to move stuff, whereas afferent just kind of comes to you. Um, controls rapid reflex response, reflexive response. When you withdraw your hand from a hot stove, contains pattern generators that help control routine behaviors, such as walking or makes your leg go like this when it's hit on your kneecap. I just thought that was cool. I think this is fascinating just to see how you sort of have like a little mini brain right inside your spinal cord. Uh, you know, making sure that your hand's going to pull away from the uh, hot fire. So a sensory neuron from the hand transmits the signals, as you can see right here, via the dorsal root of the spinal nerve into the spinal cord, where it forms a reflex arc with a motor neuron that three exits the ventral root and activates the bicep muscle, muscle to flex the arm and withdraw the hand. A sensory input also travels up the brain to produce a sensation. And a motor neuron from the brain connects to the motor neuron in the ventral horn, which adds to a voluntary activation of the muscle, though more slowly. Slow. Flash, flash, 100 yard dash. CNS does have quite a great deal of uh, protection. Um, boy, that one, that second video when they have the chop head and like it just still had the hair on the skull a little bit gross but anyway um i digress so you have what do you have you got skin you've got your aponeurosis your periosteum and then you've got bone and then you've got the meninges dura matter the tough outside the arachnoid matter which is made up of the blood brain barrier muscles or excuse me uh 
uh, capillaries and uh, blood vessels, and pia matter, uh, which is uh, on the brain surface. Brain and spinal cord float and cerebral spi spinal fluid also, which makes weight of a 1400 gram brain less than 100 grams, also cushions the brain from physical blows. What is the blood brain barrier? It's a barrier between blood vesicles in the brain, which limits passages of substances between the blood and brain, provides constant protection from toxic substance, substances in your brain, or in your blood, and from neurotransmitters circulating, circulating in your blood, such as norepinephrine, when, uh, which increases during stress. The endothelial cells uh, are packed on the outside of the capillary walls, uh, tightly to form the capillary walls outside of the blood vessels. Astrocytes, glial cells, also form structures that are thought to contribute to the blood brain barrier. Uh, most substances needed by the brain are water soluble, cannot pass through on their own. So, glucose, iron, amino acids, and many vitamins must pass through um, specialized walls or specialized transporters in these walls. Uh, the posturma in the med medulla uh, is not protected by the blood brain, but it does induce vomiting. So it can empty the stomach of its to toxic substances. For example, al alcohol before too much damage is done. So you can you have a little protection mechanism from drinking too much. And you can see right here, the action that's going on here with the tight uh, junctions of the capillary walls. Okay, so now we are taking a look at the peripheral nervous system. It consists of the cranial nerves on the underside of the brain and spinal nerves that connect to the sides of the spinal cord at each vertebra. As you can see here, spinal nerves going into the spinal cord brain, and we'll have a Picture of the uh, cranial nerves in a sec here. Subsystems, of course, are the somatic nervous system and the autonomic nervous system. Um, autonomic nervous system can, of course, be further broken down into the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. Cranial nerves, the olfactory and optic nerves are often considered part of the brain and referred to as tracks, but they have them listed here. And you can see the other nerves and what they're responsible for. And where they're at. Again, the autonomic nervous system has those two divisions. It's the control system that acts largely unconsciously, regulates bodily functions such as heart rate, digestion, respiratory rate, pupillary response, urination, and sexual arousal lot controlled by the hypothalamus or initiated that activity, right? Controlled mainly by, the, oh, there it is right there, which the hypothalamus, which acts as the command center to the limbic system. The amygdala, hippocampus, thalamus, fornix, and various cortices make up the limbic system, which generates your fight or flight response. The sympathetic nervous system activates the body in ways that help it cope with demands such as emotional stress and physical emergency. It stimulates adrenal glands to secrete epinephrine and norepinephrine, which leads to increased heart rate, blood pressure, gives you more nutrients to the body and breathing rate, more oxygen, dilated pupils and airways, slow digestion. Most of the neurons in this system pass through the sympathetic ganglion chain, which are highly connected means that the system tends to respond as a unit and it puts your body in hyperdrive. Parasympathetic nervous system, on the other hand, slows your heart rate, constricts pupils and airways, and increases digestion. In a little more uh, expanded um, diagram of the functionalities related to the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system, Oh, so that's it. So relaxes bladder, sympathetic nervous system. That's why frequent urination is a sign of like anxiety and stress. <laughs> I'll go into the other ones, but 
Okay. Uh, neural tube nervous system begins development when the nervous when the surface of the embryo forms a neural groove. The edges of this groove curl up and connect and form the tube. The tubing part will become the brain and spinal cord, while the empty space, the ventricles, and the central canal of the spinal cord. The development of the nervous system um, takes place in four stages: cell proliferation, nuclear, nuclear proliferation. Uh, cell proliferation, cell migration, circuit formation, and circuit pruning, finally. I have to say it again. <clears throat> proliferation, it's the first process. Um, cells that will become neurons divide and multiply at a rate of 250,000 new cells every minute. Neurons divide and multiply in the ventricular zone and move outward. This process is termed neurogenesis. Migration neurons move up radial glial cells, which form scaffolds towards the final location. And you can see the migrating neuron cruising up that glial fiber from the inner to the outer layer of the brain. As I said, the brain develops inside out. Circuit formation, axons of development. Developing neurons grow toward their target cells and form functional connections. For example, axons of motor neurons grow toward the spinal cord. Cells in the retina of the eye send axons to the thalamus, etc. Axons form growth cones at their tip, which sample the environment for directional cues. The chemical, there's chemical and molecular signposts that guide their movement and final destination, and it's determined by the particular genetic code of each cell that makes, of course, this wonderful being of who you are that can have all these wondrous things in terms of taking in sense information and making sense of it and stuff like that. Brain formation. Well, what happens is also circuit pruning. That's the eliminating um, of excess neurons and synapses. The initial stage neurons that have trouble finding a landing site or arrive late are pruned. And later stage neurons that are underused are also pruned. Neurotropins uh, contribute to this process through enhancing the development and survival of neurons. Synaptic plasticity is a term where specific patterns of synaptic activity result in changes in synaptic strength is thought to contribute to learning and memory, or another word for it is long-term potentiation. The heavy in principle that neurons that fire, we talked about in the last chapter, neurons that fire together or wire together, and thus there's changes in synaptic strength. That's called synaptic plasticity, plasticity of course. Apparently decreases with age as I had a flash Flash, 100 yard dash moment. Yes, I would love to hear a joke. What has three pumps? A pregnant camel. Ah! Myelination of neurons, another important stage of development of nervous system, starts around the third trimester of field development, completes around late adolescence or beyond. Uh, when they finally have their myelination down and can make some, and a prefrontal cortex more developed and make some more uh, wise decisions that decrease one's or potentially your uh, insurance rate, insurance rates for uh, your car insurance. And no, no. So reorganization is uh, the idea that stimulation from the out outside world will continue to shape synaptic construction and reconstruction throughout your life. This idea is uh, much of it involves reorganization. Shifting connections that changes the area's function. For example, blind people who read Braille, the space of the brain devoted to the index reading thing finger increased at the expense of the area corresponding to other fingers on the same hand. 
blind people who excel at sound localization and develop a part of their brain normally to use that's used sight towards sound localization. So this is the idea of uh, certain areas of the brain reorganizing to accomplish different functions depending on uh, stimulation and requirements of survival for the people. Most brain plasticity is lost at page two to three. And they give the uh, example of syndactyly. And uh, seven days after surgery for this condition, representation of fingers became distinct in the motor cortex. So uh, parts of the motor cortex are waiting for uh, stimulation. And uh, once it has that new stimulation, it will uh, sort of reorganize and create areas for that. Stroke damage can lead to the nervous system. TBI. Regeneration is the regrowth of severed, severed axons. Myelin provides a guide to for the drone to grow through, and the axon is guided to its destination, much as in development, but it's quite limited due to molecular and chemical conditions that limit growth, scar tissue, glial cells that uh, produce axon growth inhibitors, and immune cells that move into the area and possibly interfere with regrowth. Neurogenesis. Neurogenesis is the term of the birth of new neurons. Occurs in several areas in the adult brain, most extensive in the hippocampus and near lateral ventricles, supplying the olfactory bulb. Compensation is a term for uninjured tissue that takes over functions of lost areas, and reorganization functions are taken over by another, by other more distant areas, typically by cells in an adjacent area, but may involve the other hemisphere, for example, in language deficits. Different areas where we're looking to repair neuronal death or severed neurons. And that is the end of chapter three.